So uh, let me start out by uh, saying that there's a paradox at the heart of fintech and its relation to con uh, consumer banking in the US. And what is that paradox? It really comes from two contradictory things that are equally true about fintech and banking in the US. The first true thing is that no one can be a fintech bank. And the second true thing is that anyone can be a fintech bank. As I said, it's a bit of a paradox. So let's start with the first true thing, that uh, why today no one can be a fintech bank. That's because it's enormously difficult for financial technology companies to get regulators to approve their banking applications here in the US. It's a bit different in some other places, including the UK. Uh, Raj, who's in the middle of many of these efforts, uh, will tell us some of the reasons why it's been so difficult. Uh, but let's remind ourselves why some fintechs want to become real banks in the first place. It's because licensed banks get direct access to the payment system, they get deposits which provide uh, stable low-cost funding, and they get a national platform where they can preempt um, conflicting state laws that might uh, complicate their business. These are extremely valuable privileges despite the many costs and restrictions that go along with them. And it's especially so for um, payments innovators in fintech and for lenders. And that's why many fintechs, um, Vero Money, Lending Club, OnDeck, Robinhood, Square, and Revolut, among others, are actively trying to become banks of one type or another in the US. But no one's made it to the goal line yet. Meanwhile, US state and federal banking regulators are engaged in a, an, they're arguing with each other and suing each other over uh, the terms on which fintechs might uh, be able to get access to the uh, core banking system. So that's why I say today that today, no one can be a fintech bank. So what about my second proposition, that today, anyone can be a fintech bank? This one is true because so many fintechs, it seems like a new one pops up uh, every day, have created what I call synthetic banks. What's a synthetic bank? It's a company that provides insured checking and savings accounts, payment cards, and most of the capabilities of a traditional consumer bank to its uh, customers without actually being a bank. Think of Aspiration, uh, Andre's company, which was an, one of the pioneers of this type of fintech banking, or Chime, or Vero Money again, or N26, or Moneyline, or Betterment, or Fidelity, for that matter. It's done by combining customer-friendly user experience with access to parts of the regulated financial system through contracts with existing banking players. And there are experienced specialized service providers like Camber and Promontory that uh, make synthetic banking close to a plug and play experience. And as a result, just about anyone can start offering banking services to consumers within a few months after deciding that it's a good idea. So then, if, if both of the things I said are true, that no one can be a fintech bank and anyone can be a fintech bank, we're facing an unstable, obviously an unstable policy environment that probably can't last for long which makes today a critical moment for thinking about um, digital evolution and the future of consumer banking. Technology is uh, uh, <coughs> rapidly transforming the way that banking services are delivered and priced, and it's pushing many traditional business models and regulatory structures that are, um, relate to them uh, to the edge of irrelevance. Traditional banks are fighting hard to hold on to their monopoly on deposit banking and the payment system with inertia as their powerful ally. And in the real world, entrepreneurs like Andre are trying to decide whether to challenge the current system directly or try to fit in within its operational and financial limitations. Venture capital uh, investors like Hans are, are making bets on which approach makes the most sense for them as investors. And we all need to look at uh, China to see that a well-functioning consumer banking system can look very different from what we see here in the US. So there's no better time to be uh, airing these issues, and let's get on with the show. We're going to hear f uh, from our three speakers for about 10 minutes each, followed by a group discussion, which I'll moderate, and then we'll have some audience questions. So Hans, you're up first. Okay. So I'm going to sit right here, right? Uh, so I want to take everyone back to 2004, let's say, about 15 years ago, and let's think about the banking system and how people got financial services. So most everybody would have a core deposit bank, a, a place where your direct deposit would be sent. It would offer a bunch of services. It would be your core transaction account. Sometimes you would borrow with that company. Sometimes you might invest with that company. But generally, in America, in the United States, 
people got pretty good at wanting the best in class service. So even if you had your, your deposit account with Bank of America, you might go to Vanguard for your retirement account, or you might, uh, you know, you might go to uh, Capital One for a credit card, or you might really like a United credit card because that's where, and that's offered by Chase. So that people were actually, the cross-selling didn't, in my opinion, didn't really work despite many efforts for very sophisticated institutions to try and do it because you were well-informed consumers and you were pretty good at picking the best in class service. You could get those services by phone, but usually by a call center. Uh, you would, you'd have branches, you'd have pretty modern experiences, and if you were credit worthy, if you had a job and you had, you had money flowing through your transaction accounts, in general, that was a profitable relationship for most of those banks, and most people felt pretty satisfied with those services. So that's 2004. So then what happened, two things coincided, which had, in my opinion, very profound impact. One was the financial crisis. And that had two big impacts. One was it suddenly created significant distrust, a big, nasty hangover in terms of people's feeling about their relationships with these financial institutions. And second, it created a massive global re-regulation cycle. So regulation, and Raj can talk about this, but we could go back 200 years, we could certainly go back to the Civil War and I could explain how regulation ebbs and flows with financial institutions in the United States in somewhat pretty unique ways. I think the United States is unique in the distrust that we have with centralized economic power and then our interest in uh, centralized economic power. But in the United States, that since the first, it's the most significant re-regulation cycle since, I would say, since the Great Depression when there's lots of, of major, major laws uh, passed. So suddenly, banks, in order to survive, they shut down all their innovation factories. Every penny was spent on responding to this very significant re-regulation cycle. So a lot of innovation got put on hold and people were uh, just, the major institutions were really fighting for their survival as, as organizations. What was the other big development? The other big development was a significant changes in technology. Uh, two in particular, the cloud and, and the ability to, in effect, buy infrastructure by the drink. Instead of having to build a lot of expensive, very difficult technical infrastructure to be a financial institution, I could buy that piece by piece by piece and pay usage fees for it. That cut down dramatically the expense of getting into business. And the second thing was, all of you, by the time we get to 2010, the iPhone had happened, and Android had happened. And suddenly, I think the, the, the way we describe it is your expectation of what a tech-curated experience should be like was very different from the way it was in 2004. So you won't put up with, my, my father's 88 years old, and he says, this goddamn form from Morgan Stanley is so stupid, I'm not going to fill it out. And that, you know, 2004, we just filled it out and sent it in. And, and so everybody's expectation is different. But if you, if you talk about many people, particularly people like you or people even younger than you, your expectations are that you will now trust, the nature of your trust has changed. You might trust Amazon and maybe you trusted Facebook, maybe you don't any longer, but you certainly had a trust of technology that compared to the distrust of financial institutions, which I think was brought about by the financial crisis. So into this world, what's happened? Well, suddenly we went from, in, when uh, I've been in financial services almost 40 years, and, and I would say um, most of the time, we look at, at history and say, when have there been really significant moves in terms of customers changing their behavior significantly? Well, in the late 70s, Citi introduced massive ATMs in the New York metropolitan area, and they created a 5%, 5 percentage points deposit shift, shift in deposits because of saturation of ATM. Mm -hmm. And as a result, all the other banks got together and created this ATM network called NICE, which led to debit cards, by the way, I can talk about that. But, and then similarly, um, there was a big credit card revolution in the early 90s when the biggest, uh, th there was companies like Capital One and, and, and BNA and some others, which uh, First USA, which really targeted much lower, like they, they lowered rates dramatically and they got significant market share movement. 
Fidelity, Vanguard, others, they, 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 you see things where it took a while, but they get, you know, largest uh, asset manager in the world was Prudential Insurance in 1980. Um, and they're not even in the top 20 any longer. So you do get these shifts, but it, it takes a while. What, what I would say uh, started happening is fintech companies, instead of being, you know, a few dozen 20 years ago, there are now, in our estimate, about 15,000 venture-funded fintech companies. They started creating hooks and getting customers to migrate to them. And in a few cases, those hooks were very significant, and they got to millions of customers. Robinhood or Chime, uh, Andre's company, actually, I remember when we were just starting and the progress that uh, he's made and what he said he was going to do is quite remarkable. That would have, so you had really significant changes where people were getting some, a few million customers, lending club on the lending side. So where we are right now, though, is, in my opinion, a major sorting out that has to happen in terms of exactly what revenue sources and what services are going to be offered by these institutions. And think about this, the revenue sources, if you're a bank, and let's, we'll talk more about that maybe in the discussion, but what do you think about a bank? But I'd say the most important part of a banking relationship is your transaction account. Where does money go in, and then how do you get it out? How do you make payments, pay bills, pay others through payment cards? Second thing is, so the sources, the revenue sources from that are fees, so monthly type fees, which most people don't like doing interchange revenue from a debit card or a credit card. So when I pay, I, get, I make some money. Float, which is very, very low right now. And that's about it. Now you can add in borrowing, lending. Lending can create revenue. You can add in asset management and savings type accounts. But right now, those are pretty skinny fees if you're just relying on those couple of assets. And again, it depends on what type of customer you are. If you're wealthy and you spend a lot, that can be a very lucrative relationship just doing that. If you're not wealthy, you don't spend a lot, you don't get that much in, you don't get that, you don't pay for that much, very hard to make that, those numbers work. You're gonna add in two other variables, okay? So we got, what's your revenue model? Second thing is, what's your cost model? So costs, uh, you can, by starting fresh and having great new technology, you can, you can maybe get costs down to very, very low levels. You know, maybe you can do it 80% cheaper than a bank account, the tr traditional bank account could be run. Maybe 90%, maybe 95%. How cheap can you make it if it's all digital and your onboarding costs and all your customer acquisition costs are low? How cheap can that get? It's a very significant question. And then the other one, which is what's gonna feed into this whole discussion, and this is complicated, so you actually have to pay attention to this part, is how much capital do you need to run that business enterprise? So remember in financial services, everything is regulated for a very good reason. Because money attracts crooks, it creates systemic risk, and countries, and every country regulates every aspect of financial services. Whether the company itself is regulated depends on its activities. If you're a bank, you are regulated, not just activities, the whole company is regulated. So what, and if you're regulated, you need a certain amount of capital to support the risks that you're undertaking. So the question on all these different business models, how much capital does your business model require? And if you're just renting these services the way Todd suggested, can you get your costs low enough if you're renting an activity from another institution? Many, many of these institutions are saying, we can't get our costs low enough for renting. We have to be regulated ourselves, but that means you need more capital. So what type of ROE do you need? What does that company trade at? Because it's no longer a software company. You need capital. What's your ROE? All those things are parts of the equation. So I want to set, and now everyone's getting into the act. All the people that started as FINRA regulated uh, asset manager models are saying we want to start, like a Robin Hood or uh, Aspiration are saying, we want to offer a, uh, a debit card type product. Everyone started as a lending company, like Lending Club, is saying, well, we should offer a banking product, a deposit product. A lot of companies like Chime, which are prepaid models, are saying, how can we ever expand our services into borrowing and other things? So all these different models have acquired customers, but now they're saying, how do we adjust our services to be more profitable and have a more complete relationship with these customers? And that brings up a lot of complicated questions. And so I want to come back to all this once everyone's had a chance to 
weigh in, but keep in mind, how much capital do you need? What are the costs associated with your business model? And how low could those go? And what are the revenue sources and how attractive are those? And then we'll add in a couple of other variables later, but those are the main ones. So that's fantastic uh, introduction to um, the investor view. Now let's talk, talk to an entrepreneur who's trying to function within that environment and in that history. So Andre, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, Aspiration and what you're trying to do? Uh, great to be with everybody here today. Uh, I'm from Arizona. Our, our company's based in Los Angeles, uh, so just have to say it is incredibly cold here. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you guys realize how cold it is, but it is very, very cold, and uh, a testament to my esteem for, uh, uh, for Professor Baker that, uh, that I'm glad to be here uh, under this insanely frigid uh, conditions. Um, as, as Todd laid out these questions about what constitutes a bank, I think it's important to think about which perspective you're bringing to that question. And as Todd laid out those attributes around access to payments and uh, access to the uh, Fed funds window and, and so on and, and ability to lend, th that's certainly true from a regulatory standpoint. It's true from a legal standpoint but it's not necessarily true from a customer standpoint. No customer thinks what defines a bank for me is whether or not they have access to the Fed funds window. What is a bank? A bank is where you keep your money. Uh, it's where you pay for things. It's how you pay for things. You write a check, you use a debit card. Uh, it's where your financial home ultimately is. It's that place where you put, as, as Hans was referencing, your trust. And it's in that environment that I think you're seeing this kind of explosion of fintech innovation that Hans has talked about and that he's been part of uh, fueling and funding and, uh, and, and, and guiding um, <coughs> along with Todd, along with Raj. Uh, and for us at Aspiration, we have come into it seeing a lot of the same dynamics that Hans referenced, but maybe from a 45 degree different viewpoint. For us, we've really built the company on the belief that what matters most in financial services is trust. And when you look at what's going on in fintech and you, you read the articles and, and there's so much conversation around uh, different technology solutions and different products that are being brought to, to market and different features that are cool, whether it's rolling up your spare change or getting your paycheck two days early, all of these, all of these different attributes. And all of those things are important better user experience, important. All of these things are important. None of them are sufficient. Because if you're looking at bringing innovation into the financial services industry, uh, and you are not grappling with the fact that less than 10% of Americans say they trust their own financial institution, then you're missing the 10,000 pound elephant in the room. And that dynamic that Hans was speaking about where you go to uh, your bank, your Bank of America for one thing and Vanguard for another thing and Capital One for another thing. Partly that's about people out there hunting for the best solution, that's, that's true. But there's another aspect to it where people are hunting for that because they have not found any solution where they are willing to believe that that institution actually cares about them and has their best interests at heart. And when they do have that kind of relationship, their actions change fundamentally, uh, and, and they look very different. Um, anybody here familiar with USAA? So uh, some of you know uh, it is um, serving uh, military families, veteran families, and has really built a very different kind of approach, and what you see is customers there going for their credit card and their car insurance and, and all of these other products, yes, because they offer a good deal, but also because they've been able to build trust. Mm -hmm. And that matters today because uh, what the source of that distrust is not necessarily just because of, uh, of, of the financial meltdown in, in 2009. Uh, somebody said to me not too long ago, all you fintech companies are, are coming up because of 2009 and, and because of uh, the Great Recession. and, and uh, and all that anti-Wall Street, anti-Big Bang sentiment. And 
And my response was, that has something to do with it. But what matters more is not 2008 and 2009. It is, as Hans referenced, it's 2007. And it's the birth of the iPhone. Because that's actually what has fundamentally changed things. Not just the hunt for more products, not the hunt for technology. It's about individual empowerment. Because the way that people now pick their bank, and that definition of bank, as I was talking about before, how they look for that financial home has changed dramatically. I'll do a little experiment here, which is uh, a little bit iffy on a, on a college or, or university campus. Who here is with their current bank, the place that they think of as their main financial home where they have their checking account, their, their bank account? Who here is with that institution? Because at the time that they opened that account, it had the branch that was closest to them or one of the closest ones to them physically. So most hands in the room, if everybody here was 20 years older, it would be basically every hand in the room. And that's because when you, up to 2004 and 2010 and so on, it, when you picked your bank, you did so almost always because of geographic proximity. And when Todd was out there building a lot of these uh, banking institutions, uh, not so long ago, no. uh, <laughs> the way you grew your bank was you built more branches. And if you wanted to build it a lot, you would acquire that branch or that bank in the next town over or the next state over. And that's how you built your footprint. Well, now you can open an account on the phone that every single one of us is carrying around in our pockets just as easily at Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase, City, Aspiration, Chime, Revolut, N26, Robin Hood, Betterment, and the list goes on and on. And so how we pick becomes fundamentally different. And it becomes really a reflection not of what institution is closest to us physically, but what ins institution is closest to us mentally. Which, speaks, which institution speaks to us, who we are, how we look at the world, what's important to us, what our concerns are, uh, how we get up every day and think about our money. And so what we've really built that aspiration is, is this category around socially conscious, sustainable retail banking. Uh, believing that what we care about as the people building the company is what a lot of other people out there care about, which is not only making money, but also making a positive difference in the world. And that there's a lot of people out there who are looking for a way, as we say, to uh, both do well and do good and that you should be able to do both, and that there should be a financial institution that allows you to do both and that has those kinds of concerns at its core. And so when you bank with Aspiration, all your deposits are fossil fuel free, firearm free, as opposed to many other banks that are taking those deposits and investing them in oil and gas uh, pipelines and exploration and, and gun manufacturers and so on. Uh, when you're spending with that Aspiration debit card, um, we provide you your own personal sustainability score. Uh, we call it AIM score, Aspiration Impact Measurement. Allows you to see on a daily basis how you're doing in terms of your sustainable impact based on where you're shopping and spending. Uh, and gives you some of that information so you can make those decisions. How does CVS rank against Walgreens or Rite Aid or Dwayne Reed? Uh, how does Burger King rank against McDonald's? And so on so you can think about what is the impact on people and, and the planet based on where you're shopping and spending every day. Uh, offer investment products built, again, on uh, investing in companies with very strong environmental, sustainable, uh, employee diversity governance practices. Uh, and at the same time, offer what we think is some of the best financial products when it comes to cash back, when it comes to interest rate, and, and all these other traditional concerns as well. Because what we're solving for, is, again, is trust. Uh, the drivers of that distrust are a misalignment of interests and incentives, and a misalignment of values. People understand that no matter what happened in 2009 and, and the financial meltdown, that every single day, for most people, these large financial institutions make money when things go wrong for you. They make money based on overdraft fees, late fees, service fees, ATM fees, uh, and that means that they're sitting on the opposite side of the table from you. And so at Aspiration, our only fee from the customer is what we call pay what is fair. Customer decides what to pay us. If they want to pay us zero, they can pay us zero, up to us to earn the fee. Great majority of customers choose to pay even though they don't have to. 
And then that misalignment of value is really around putting ourselves in line with what our customers care about and what we care about in building an institution that has those concerns at its heart. Now, all of that is, is well and good, but those pay what is fair fees are in incredible in the fact that most customers choose to pay us. Um, it, it's not enough to build a, a, a sustainable business, sustainable in, in the economic sense of the term as, as well as the environmental. Uh, and so what we had to do was to figure out how to navigate this kind of dynamic that Todd and Hans were talking about, which is this situation where after 2009, there haven't been new bank charters being issued to fintechs. And so that's meant that if you are launching one of these online banks, these neo banks, challenger banks, it's meant that your only way to get to market is by sitting on top of a third party bank. And there's become a handful or so of, of banks around the country that have built a business around really being the back end for all of these uh, fintech driven banks that essentially become just um, layers sitting on top of those accounts. When you open an account at one of these neobanks, you're not actually opening a real regulatory legal account with them. You're opening an account at Bancor or Lincoln Savings Bank or any number of, of other banks that are out there. And that process works great until you're successful. Because the problem is then the more accounts you have, the more assets you have with uh, any one of these institutions, the harder and harder it is to ever break free from them. And ultimately that means that for all intents and purposes, that institution that the customers have maybe never heard of becomes the, the force that's in the driving seat. And so what we did at Aspiration last year was really become the first neobank in the country to, to go independent, as we call it, and break off of a third-party bank sponsor to create our own independent structure. But because there's not these bank charters being issued, what we did was build it around a brokerage cash management account, the same kind of uh, cash management account that you get if you're a customer of uh, Morgan Stanley or Fidelity or any of these other brokerage institutions, uh, but one built out so that while it's not a bank from the kind of definition that, that Todd was talking about, it provides the services that somebody would expect from a bank. Debit card, paper check, mobile app, mobile uh, bill pay, mobile check deposit, FDIC insurance based on how we sweep our deposits into FDIC insured banks. and. That's what Todd's talking about when he talks about a synthetic bank. To do so has meant that in the current circumstances, in a circumstance where they're not issuing new charters, you've had to really, as we've seen, create this uh, Rube Goldberg, Frankenstein kind of mechanism where we've stitched together different pieces to create for the customer what is a banking experience, even if it's not a bank from a legal and regulatory standpoint. And I think you're going to see more and more of that. Um, what technology has done, what this distrust has done, has, I think, laid the groundwork for what's first been just a complete break apart of uh, the incumbent institutions as we've known them. That doesn't mean that Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase, they're, they're not going anywhere. But a lot of their products and services have, have splintered apart. Uh, and, and people are hunting for these different options. And that's been this unbundling that people have talked about. And I always compare it a little bit to the end of the, the fall of the Roman Empire, where suddenly you had these hundreds and thousands of, of little principalities, each about a mi mile square in, in size. And eventually, and I think what you're seeing now over the past couple of years has been this rebundling, where for the vast majority of us, we don't want 35 different financial uh, apps on our phone, each one doing a tiny piece. We want that place that is what our parents and grandparents would have thought of as their bank, that, their financial home. And I think what's happening now in terms of both the regulatory, legal, and, uh, and consumer standpoint is a race to start to reassemble those pieces and to build those customer relationships around trust and around those shared incentives that are going to drive uh, a customer relationship for many years to come. Great. 
Uh, that's uh, extremely helpful um, in understanding the perspective of someone who's really tried to uh, battle these uh, issues over the last few years. So Raj, um, from your perspective on, on all this, what do you think um, has happened and will be happening in this area? Well, thank you, Todd, and a pleasure to be here with all of you uh, this evening. Um, there is clearly a drive to try and be a bank if you can, and what you're hearing is how difficult it really is. And I think there are multiple reasons. Todd mentioned several in his introductory remarks. Uh, the uh, desire to be able to take deposits for funding reasons, for the complete package of financial services reasons. Uh, in addition, banks give you access to the payment system. But there's a, still another reason. If you are anything other than a bank, you have a really very difficult regulatory environment to navigate. And it's not because of the safety and soundness requirements, which, as Hans pointed out, is critical to a bank, but not to a finance company. It is more that you have to try and comply with the laws of 50 different states, each of which has its own regulatory system. And in fact, if you make different types of loans, you may need three or four licenses in various states. Now, sort of the quintessential problem is illustrated by interest rate ceilings. Every state has its own set of interest rate requirements. And so if you are a lender lending into 50 states, you have to have the systems and the people to try and comply with all 50 sets of rules. And it's not just that you can look at and say, well, this state permits me to charge 11% interest or 15 or whatever it is or 35. Uh, you also have to look at what each state does in defining what is interest. In some cases, fees count. In other states, fees don't. Some states have certain types of fees, other states others. And even the calculation methodology can change from state to state. So it is a uh, real uh, issue to try and develop the systems and again, the people to be able to comply with this uh, incredible patchwork quilt of laws. And frankly, to call it a patchwork quilt is to dishonor uh, <laughs> quilt makers. Um, uh, there is, I think, one other aspect of this, which we have more than touched on the synthetic uh, approach to banks. What is a near bank? What really defines a bank when you look at the law is the ability to take deposits. And that leads to the question of what is a deposit? The federal law, it's one of the vestiges left of the Glass-Steagall Act, and probably all 50 states preclude taking deposits without a license, a banking license. But how close can you come to being a deposit, deposit-like, without <coughs> crossing the line? And it's one of these, it was lost in, in history, but the banking industry came very close in the, I guess, late 70s, early 80s, to launching a challenge, a court challenge, against the money market mutual funds that those were deposits for purposes of the statutes. Of course, after there are so many trillions of dollars in those funds, the idea of a court challenge is not very um, innovative. <laughs> and uh, I think we're seeing exactly the same thing with the progressive fintech companies uh, absent a challenge if there is a point at which it's just not challengeable, not as a technical legal matter, but as a practical matter. So let me just spend a couple minutes on why 
fintech companies aren't banks? Why don't they create banks? And I think there are probably five or six reasons, and I'll save the most important to last. In the first place, some fintech companies are engaged in activities which are just not permissible for an affiliate of a bank. And uh, this is not just the company itself, but p potentially the investors in the bank who are deemed under a very broad concept of control to control the, the fintech company and therefore the bank. If you are deemed to control a bank, second, then you are a bank holding company and you have to serve a, as a source of strength to the bank, which is an open-ended, unlimited commitment to support the bank if something goes wrong. Third, in order to bec become a owner of a bank, you have to provide a lot of information about yourself. And the regulatory agencies are quite good in confidentiality, but there are a number of investors, and in particular some foreign investors, who are not all that thrilled with giving up the information that the regula regulators require. Fourth, and we've discussed this um, already, banks are subject to an extensive regulatory scheme, capital, liquidity, stress testing, et cetera. And then, and probably the most important, is that trying to acquire or establish a bank is a long, laborious, and unpredictable process. Or maybe it is predictable, since, as Andre said, nobody's gotten one <laughs> in 10 years. Um, I think that uh, may change. Uh, but um, it, it really is a very difficult situation. And this is not unintentional because the federal regulators are well aware of a correlation between the likelihood of failure of a bank and how recently it has been chartered. And so that makes them very nervous about uh, de novo banks. Todd, I could go on you know, forever, I'm sure, but why don't we stop here and 